This morning I have a, I want you to go to the psalm if you have the Bible with you. The 60th and a part of the 61st psalm I would like to look at. And I'd like to entitle my message, if you wish to call it such, After the Victory. In the psalm that we're looking at, the 60th psalm, we find that David had just managed to win a great victory. And uh, how many people in their lives have won a great victory? I think the greatest victory that we can have is receiving Christ as our Savior. Amen. And uh, one of the things that often will happen to us after something that really lifts us up and we're high and mighty and doing things and feeling greatly about them, we all of a sudden sort of take a nosedive and we become disturbed and distraught sometimes and find that we're not as excited as we were and we wonder why. Why is this happening? And like David, he asked this question here, and I want to read this to you. It says, O God, thou hast cast us off, thou hast scattered us, thou hast been displeased, O turn thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble, you have broken it, and heal the breaches thereof, for it is shaken. You have showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. And we pause there. Really, this was a great victory that he had gone through. He recites this victory in the latter part of this song, and it is without any doubt whatsoever, it is a great thing. But you know, the interesting thing about any victory, there is a time and period after that victory in our lives. How many people, of course, all of you young people are going to school, no doubt. And you got through last year, and as the exams were finished, and you begin to receive your results, you felt a great elation about that, amen? It? it felt really good, I have accomplished something. But over the summer, that accomplishment seems to have faded away a little bit, and you feel like, you know, I've got to do it again. I've got to go out and fight another battle, and I don't know how many years ago left, but it doesn't matter. Until the completion of school, you have the same situation ongoing. And you know what's interesting? Uh, David had the same thing. As a young man, I keep, most of the psalms that he wrote was either from the battlefield itself or hidden in some cave or some place, hiding from his enemy. But here, he is uh, really have, has accomplished a great, great victory. Maybe they were few and far between. In the next psalm that we look at, he's really uh, putting down or quelling a, a rebellion from Absalom, his own son. And uh, I'm sure he's looking to see what is he going to do in this case. You know, he, he really feels a great deal of uh, concern about that, but here we find in this part, he says, Lord, don't cast us off. And I'm sure there has there ever been a time you felt like God has turned his back upon you and things are not going exactly like you think they ought to go and you just feel all out of sorts and you wonder what on earth is going on and what have you done to deserve all of this and the other thing that is occurring in your life and you say, Lord, what is it? Have I shamed you? Have I sinned against you? David, of course, if anyone in the whole scripture had ever sinned against his God, David had done that time and time again in a terrible kind of thing. And yet God referred to David as what? His own. As his own son, right? And so, but here he goes on and he still says, you've scattered us. Have you been displeased? Turn yourself again to us. You've made the earth, at least he pictures in his eyes, he feels that the whole earth under it is trembling, his whole foundation is falling away, there is nothing left, and he thinks, God, if you don't, you let him. Nothing's going to happen. You have showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. But then in, in verse 4, he sort of changes his approach to what's going on. He says, Thou hast given us a banner to them that fear thee. 
that it may be displayed because why? Of the truth. Truly, we are a better people, are we not? You know, when things don't go just right for us, what do we to do? Do we sit down in total despair and give up and not go on and say, you know, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. Someone told me the moment that I became a Christian, I would, I would have absolutely everything. There are preachers that are on the television that would tell you that, you know, there's going to be just everything coming your way. Money galore, uh, two cars in the garage, and on and on they will go about the fabulous things that are going to immediately happen to you the moment you become a child. Of you. I don't think that happened in my life. And I don't think that's going to happen in any of your lives either. There are, I think sometimes, God does chastise us purposely to bring us down to the realm of reality where He is the real thing. He's not promising us any great rewards while we're here. God will look after us all the time we're here. Don't have any fear about that. He tends to take care of everything that we have need of. And I want to use that word need not what we want or we desire to have. How many people like to have their own car here this morning? How about you? Yeah. How about you like to have a car? You hold on to have a car? No? Well, how about when the moment you're in time to you go get your license? Now, when I was a young man, I was 16, I got my first license. And I thought, wow, life has really begun. And I went out and bought me a car. And I thought, wow, I am right now. But you know that word it wasn't nothing. The elation came earlier on when I was a younger boy when I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. This was the very beginning of life as it is today for me. I'm safely in the arms of Christ and I'm there not for just a day or a year or the rest of my life. I'm there for how long? I'm there for eternity. He has said he will never desert us nor leave us. He, we are always his. And that's something that we need to be holding and take into guard. Battles are going to come in your life. Victories can be won in your life. But you know what we need to be careful of is not pinning our hopes upon individual uh, things that are occurring in our lives, but pinning our hopes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And taking this banner that he has given his people, and he says here in verse 4, Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee. Now what kind of fear in reality is he talking about? Do we tremble in abject fear, crawling under the table, trying to hide from God? Is that the kind of fear that we offer to him? Not really. He wants us to be in awe of him. There's a little difference between abject awe and abject fear, is there not? There's a real difference. You know, fear is when we tremble and we can't even function. But in awe, we are giving God the proper respect that we need to give Him. He is the Heavenly Father. He is the creator of all things. He made you and I, oh, maybe not in the same manner He created Adam and Eve, but nonetheless, we are His creation. The world we live in is His creation. Everything that we see around about us is His. The world would not have you believe that. They have the idea it's mine, but it's not. God gives and He takes as He plays. I'm sure David knew that in his kingdom. He was God's man. He was God's king. And he served God. And one of the things that we look on down here, he begins, he said in verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered, saved with thy right hand. Hear me, God. He's asking. God has spoken to us in His holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem in Meadow, uh, uh, the valley of Sukkot, and uh, the Eliam is mine, and Manasseh is mine, Ephraim also in the strength of my hand. Judah is my lawgiver, Moab is my washpot. Over Eden will I cast over out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou become of me. Who will bring me in? strong city. Who will lead me on to Edom? You see, right away, he's already come through 
his victory. He's won a great battle. He's taken hold of all of Israel now. He's, he's the king. And now he has a great concern that he's going to have to face all the armies of Edom, who has been his natural enemies for years. How was he going to do? How do we grasp the next step in life? If everything is not something absolutely victorious the whole time that we're going ahead, serving God, what do we do? Do we just sit down and make a small child? So, or do we turn to the one that can bring victory for us? Where do we find victory? What do we want to do in order to receive it? What would be the first thing that you might would come to your mind if all of a sudden you're walking high and you're victorious in everything you do and all of a sudden some dark cloud appears on the sky and you're taken down from where you were. What do we do? Do we give up? Or do we go on? Do we take what we receive and strive and say, yes, my God has given me a banner, a banner that I'm going to carry forward because I am a child of the King, and it is a banner of truth that I can share with the world around us and say, this is what you need, exactly what I have received, and I didn't receive it onto myself, I received it from the Lord God on high because of His concern and His love for each and every last one of us who are His children and His, his creation. People, you know, if you would tell them today that they are a child of the king, not in the same sense that we look at it, but you belong to him. And he's sent his son into this world to die on Calvary's tree in order to set us free. And yet there are so many that absolutely refuse to receive this and never will receive it. You know, and I, I must tell you in my early ministry, one of the things that I would feel totally, you know, in rejection was that not everybody would receive Christ. But it came to the point where I understood there are those who will never receive it. Not all will come. But we need to be faithful to draw those that God would draw to Himself. And they are drawn not by our tantrums or by our anger or by us shoving and pushing them up to the front of the church to receive Christ. They come by the strong cords of love, God's love for them. And that's why God sends each and every one of us out under His banner, the banner of truth, in order that we can bring others to the same saving grace that we ourselves know and have received. Amen. That's what it's about. After the victory, there are going to be dry times. There are going to be times when we're living like they are in, in Libya, where is it Libya, where the great famine, famine is going on right now? They're starving to death there. We may feel that we're living in a dry and thirsty land, but I want you to know that God is always there, walking with us and not behind us, but alongside us, and encouraging us to go ahead. There is a victory. God will see to it. He wants you to undertake and re receive Him. Who will bring me into this strong city? Who will lead me into Eden? Well, not thou, O God, which had cast us off. O thou, O God, which did not go out with our armies, or which didn't go out with our armies, give us help from trouble. For vain is the help of man. You know, if we expect men like ourselves to really be the ones that are going to bring the victory in our own individual lives, or the lives of the church, or the life of our city, then we're mistaken. It is God that's going to bring the victory, and only He can instrument that victory for us. He is the engineer. He is the general. And I think that even in His victory, what we see about David, He understands that the commander of his armies is not himself. He's just a mere general. But God is the great 
victory and a great leader in the armies of God. He follows God because he's a part of the children of God, his remnants of the day. And he was willing to give up whatever post. He was a king, but he had one that was over him. And it doesn't matter where we rise up in the light, we need to understand that we must bow to the Almighty God. And He will lead us in the paths that we would go, the paths of righteousness. And He will take us wherever we need to go in life. And point us to those who need to hear the message that we carry in our hearts and want to share with Him. We ought to all be willing. Now what do we do after this victory? How do we, where do we go from here? And I want to look at it in these first few verses of of, and the 61st Psalm it says, Hear my cry, O God, attain unto my prayers. Which means we speak to God. You know, all of us need to speak as frequently as we can to the God of heaven. He says, From the ends of the earth will I cry unto me, when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I love that phrase. I've always loved that phrase. Looking to the higher rock. Who is that? In the order of the pecking order of the universe, God is at the very top of it all. He says, Thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower for me. He goes on, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the cover of thy wings. He pauses there and he says, He's not talking about, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, I read a, an illustration about uh, this chicken that was caught in a prairie fire. And she called all her little chicks to herself when the fire was raging just in front of her. And she hunkered her wings out over them and sat down and shielded them the best she knew how to do. And the fire raged over, killing her. But after the fire passed by, lo and behold, the little chicks came out alive and well. She had given her life for them. You see, God's Son has given His life. And we can hide under His wings for the protection we need in life. And we need to speak to it in a way that he can hear us and he hears everything we say to him. We need to come willingly and hopefully and wonderfully looking for what his guidance for our life will be. Prayer is the key, my friends. And that's why these two, I think, two psalms are truly hooked together. It says, For thou, God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Now will prolong the king's life, this is David, and his many years uh, as generations. He will abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which I which may preserve him. So I will sing praise unto thy name forever. I may daily perform my vows. All of us, the day that we accepted Christ as our personal Savior. We made a vow. What did we promise him? That we would give him our lives wholly and completely. We'd hold nothing back. You know, as a Christian, we don't own our lives. We've been bought with a great price, and the price was the shed blood of Jesus Christ in Calvary. We no longer are our own, but we belong to him. And when we, on that day, that we received Christ as our Savior, we gave it all away to him, gladly. For in return, he has given us the most wonderful gift that we can possibly have. And that's the gift of eternal life. And forgiveness for the sin that was clouding our days. And we are now set free from it. You say, well, I, I sin sometimes. We all know. You know, Paul said that he had ongoing in himself a battle all the time in his, in his limbs fighting. And it wasn't who he was fighting with. It was the old man in him. That person that was you before you come to Christ. He likes to raise his ugly head up and get on your case. But you know, our God, the one we serve, our Savior, is greater than he. Greater is he that is in our heart than he that is in the world. We need to remember that. We stand preserved in the blood of Christ and there is absolutely nothing they can take that away. And we need not let sin ever fool us by saying that all oh, it doesn't really matter much. Just like in, in the day in the Garden of Eden, we said, 
why it would be just like God's. But how foolish that was. They were. They were driven forth in the garden. And man has suffered setback after setback after setback. All through. But you know, God's opened the door. And it's always open to us. And we can always go to him whenever we have a need. And we should. We can pause in the, in the hallways of our schools. We can pause when there's a great crowd. We can pause whenever we by ourselves. And we can speak to him as we would speak one to another. And he hears every prayer that we make. And that's the interesting thing. We need to offer all manner of prayer and praise to him. After the victory, before the battle, and any battles that may come thereafter, he's there until he comes again. And we need to wait with bated breath and hearts beating rapidly with the prospect of him soon to come. And I believe it's going to be soon. We don't know, but we need to be prepared at all times for that coming. 